Hi, everyone. This is Jackie Cooper with the GBA Talk Show. I want to welcome everyone to this episode. I want to remind you to like and subscribe to GBA and to definitely check out um, the GBAglobal.org website. It's a wonderful organization that provides education and resources for those that are in the blockchain. And if you're in the government or in the private sector, um, you can network with individuals and learn more about um, the use cases that are happening um, on the blockchain, as well as the solutions that are being provided to the problems that we seem to have at different times. And with that, I want to just share a little bit of background about me, and then I'm going to hop over to my guest. Uh, for those that have not been following me on my own social media, my name is Jackie Cooper, and I'm Crypto Mom too. And I, my background's I'm a, an attorney. I'm also an author. I've written a, a series of books, Bitcoin Cinderella, Blockchain Adventures, and I'm also a blockchain consultant on a variety of topics. And I became involved with GBA because of the... Um, I love to meet people who have been in this world a lot longer than me in terms of the blockchain space, and I am learning um, so much from them. And as a result of what I'm learning, I'm trying to pass it forward to the students that I have because I'm also a teacher. So that way, those that um, are coming up the ranks can also learn about these new career paths so they can um, be the next generation of leaders for us. So Anthony has um, is also part of GBA and his company um, uh, and what they're doing really blew me away because when I first started in law, my background was in the health field. I was all about patients' rights and you know a lot of other areas in healthcare. And he, they're, what they're doing is integrating blockchain in a way with the health sector that I think um, needs to be looked at. So I'm not going to um, kind of spoil the surprise, Anthony. I want, you know, I, I really appreciate your being on. I would like you to share a little bit about your background and a little bit more about what you are doing, because I, I think it is uh, definitely needed in our community. How are you doing today? Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm, again, I'm Anthony Bigando. I'm the co-founder and CEO of ProCrodx. And, you know, I think it would be helpful to give a little context as to where we got here because it was a bit of a winding road. Um, I ran a consulting firm in Atlanta for many years, and a, a large chunk of our uh, business came from helping very large health systems, uh, very large health insurers, and ultimately the, the U.S. Uh, military on the reserve component side, um, fix broken credentialing operations. And if you've never heard of the term credentialing, what that essentially means is reviewing everything about someone's professional uh, education, history, work experiences, uh, training, and so forth, and confirming that someone can actually do what they say they can do. It's a very, very important process. It's, it's performed in most regulated industries. Uh, so whether you're in healthcare or you're in uh, you know, the oil and gas industry or you're in aviation, you know, people who work in those fields must be credentialed, right? Typically, the credentialing process has been, you know, you sign a contract to, for employment, you get handed a, a, a checklist document that says, here's all the stuff I need to get from you. You hand over a stack of paper to somebody, and they begin to contacting every source of that information manually to confirm that you actually did go to medical school. You did get a fellowship at this place. You worked at this location from X to Y. You've taken this training and to perform these procedures and so on and so forth. It is a very, very cumbersome process in, in healthcare, and it typically takes anywhere from four to six months for a physician or an advanced practice provider to go from handshake to billing and treating patients. And, you know, it's the, the average uh, for physicians here in the U.S., the average net revenue or daily billing that a, a physician uh, delivers to a health system is about $10,000 a day. So if you've got a process that's taking anywhere from 120 to 150 days to complete, think about how much net revenue the entire industry is forfeiting for every hire uh, that takes place. It's, it's crazy, right? So in doing this work, we probably about 2014, we began to invest in analyzing why credentialing was so broken and why were there, were there no technical ways for folks to collaborate and share information and not do this work redundantly and repetitively, you know, everywhere in the industry. We found that there were three problems. 
The first problem is that credentials data itself is has no definition. It's completely unstructured. It can also uh, contain data. It can contain documents, images, you know, uh, transcripts, like all kinds of, of, of information in a credential, if you will, right? The second uh, issue that we found is that everybody does credentialing differently. And there's a reason for this. You know, you may have a hospital that has a medical surgical um, or med surge department that performs a certain kind of knee replacement uh, surgery with a very specific set of devices. And if you don't know how to uh, you know, use those devices, you're not going to be competent and you're going to need to be trained and over supervised and all that. And if you really need a good knee person, right, to come in and join your, your, your surgical team, um, that's not a good fit. Whereas that same person may be a great fit for the hospital down the street, right? Health insurers have different requirements. Uh, liability insurers and malpractice insurers have different requirements. And, you know, therefore there's no, you know, there's no way to create sort of a, a common credential set, right? Because the an analytics performed against the data and the data itself varies greatly from organization to organization. And the third problem we had was the fact that no one trusts the data that they have, they receive, if you will, because they have no idea where it came from. They have no idea how it was verified supposedly or what. So every single member of the supply chain will take this set of credentials information and re-verify it again and again and again. It's just, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous how this, how this process plays out. It's needed, it's necessary, it's very important for patient safety and for, and for clinical quality and, and quality of care. But it, the way that the work is done has been broken for decades, right? About, um, as I mentioned, about uh, 2014, we began building solutions to solve those three problems. The first thing we did is we developed our ingestion engine that allows us to consume credentials data, however it exists in the wild, and make sense of it, systematize it, if you will. The second thing we built was what we call our validation engine. And this validation engine, it, you know, basically codifies the specific credentialing rules for every location down to the department and occupation level that are required for credentialing a person at a specific location or device or a company, right? You know, it's, it's a varies on our platform. We built this, we put a pretty simple UX on it, beta tested it, and we're given some pretty incredible feedback that, you know, oh my gosh, people could begin to see the end of the, uh, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it just so happened that the chief medical officer for Intel uh, was also the chief or the state surgeon for the Air Guard in California. And I reached out to him, you know, about, you know, what we had done. And he basically asked me, have you ever thought about blockchain for this solution? And I had not. Um, I had always, this is, you know, back in 2017, I had always considered blockchain at that point as being more of a crypto, you know, exactly. use case and, and less of a business application, right? And he, uh, he educated me very quickly on how uh, blockchain could be used in credentialing. He wrote a white paper about it. And he introduced me to a company in Nashville called Hashed Health. I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with them, but Hash is, uh, is probably a global leading venture development studio that's focused on blockchain-based healthcare solutions. And we uh, hit it off like a like a, a ton of bricks. And I really enjoyed, you know, their collegiality and their and their instincts around how you know, we could take what we had originally built. And, and build a platform, uh, you know, based on distributed ledger, um, you know, in, into market. We did that and that is what became ProCredX. So, you know, we are a, uh, you know, we're a company that focuses on primarily ensuring that the professionals that serve our communities every day can do their work and we can minimize the burdens, administrative burdens that are placed upon them. So, so that's the 50,000 foot view. No, I love it. Um, so for those that might be new to the blockchain world, how would you define blockchain? Um, and um, I know how I would define it from uh, a crypto or Bitcoin minting side, uh, but how mm -hmm. do you define it from an information perspective? So blockchain solved my third problem I described earlier. It allowed us to, to build an immutable trust in the data itself. Right. If you think about the nature of this information, it's full of PII, PHI. It's it's all about someone's identity, if you will. It's literally everything other than the financial information about a human being or a piece of equipment or whatnot. Right. And you know, 
when you receive this information, it's so critically important to know that it's legitimate. You know, this is what drove this manual verification of this information across the, you know, across the industry. What we're able to do is, is ingest this uh, data electronically, hash it as soon as it crosses our platform and, and firewalls and know and, and be able to ensure everyone who wants, who's going to be dependent on that information going forward, its source, how it was verified, who verified it, who owns the data, if there's copyright protections on the data, all of that. And that's, a, that's what we use DLT for, is to lock down the data and build an immutable trust in the information that we have on the platform. So I'm still going to back it up a little bit um, with in the I'm going to talk about the crypto set first, and then we're going to go back over to what you're doing, just because I want some clarification. Um, sure. So when I explain blockchain to people, I always explain it's sort of like Legos getting, you know, connected together. Um, and then I realized in explaining it to a friend, I said, it's more like a train. Every train mm -hmm. has cars. And in the cars, mm -hmm. there are seats. And when the, when the seats get filled full, then the doors could close. And that block then is no longer available for information to be put into that block. So the next people have to go to the next car. So, mm -hmm. um, so from a minting perspective. So with what you're doing, you're using information. You're not creating coins or tokens. But no. my, my question is, is each block one person or you is the information that you're verifying and storing multiple people within a block and then how do you um deter, how do you separate the information within that block if it's more than one so this is a very good question um we do not store data if you okay. will on the on the distributed ledger we okay. hash the data and in its entirety so, for example, you know, uh, uh, a credential can be 85 fields of metadata. It can have three uh, PDF documents, uh, a, a GIF image, and something else. We take the entire set of data related to that credential, hash it, right? Store the hash and some other information, proprietary information on the ledger, and then point back to that data in our data set, right? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, Blockchain, if it's used as a database, it's being used improperly, right? Because it, it will it will rapidly, the train will get real big, real fast, and real slow, right? <laughs> well, and, and, right? and you're right about the the speed, um, because with more information on the blockchain, that's why different um, off blockchain off protocol layers have been created, so that way transactions or events can happen not directly on the blockchain because it has been getting slow Bitcoin and some of the others. So it's interesting what you're talking about for those that don't know what hash means. Can you define it? It's a, you, you take the data in its entirety and you run a cryptographic uh, standard formula against that data to generate a key, right? And that key is immutable um, because, you know, so for example, um, you can hash, as I mentioned before, the data, documents, all this other stuff, and, and you know, and, and and put it in a bucket called a credential. You can then take that hash and test that data every time it's used, right? So, and it, because what we have to be able to tell our members is that we guarantee you that this data has never been modified. If it's a pixel on a PDF document, right, a one character in a in a data field the whole the, the hash kicks out the the data and we be, we uh, we disable that data uh, you know on the on the exchange so it it is the way that we can drive trust right and drive trust and reliability of the information and frankly this the use case around credentialing is almost an ideal use case for an early you know uh, an early solution using this technology right because we were not trying to tokenize uh, value. We're not trying to, you know, mint stuff and coins and all that. We're literally trying to find a way to ensure folks that their information was reliable, right? And it and it was a, uh, I believe it's been a very good, you know, let's call it V1 use case for this technology in the healthcare industry. 
So explain more the type of clients that might benefit from using your services um, and how it can save them both money and time, because that's the other thing that as we were talking before we started recording, you know, it was like an aha moment for me. So we do not sell ProCredX as a point solution, if mm -hmm. you will, right? We have to build collaborative networks, right? Because the value from ProCredX does not come from one organization using it comes from an entire commercial ecosystem using it. So let's use healthcare, for example, you know, um, credentials information is a function of commerce, right? Because, you know, when you hire a physician, it, you know, you've got to get all their information. Then you, once you've finished verifying it, you need to send it to every health insurance company you're contracted with, which may be 20, 25 organizations, uh, any telemedicine organizations, outpatient clinics that you work with, affiliates that, that work with your hospital system, all are going to take the same bucket of information and analyze it in their lenses that they have regarding what's good and what's not good, right? And make a determination as to whether or not this individual uh, is eligible, lack of a better term, to work within that network, right? And, and, and uh, you know, what we've done is we've automated that analysis for all parties concurrently, Right. So when I'm sending data that needs to go to, let's say I'm, I'm a hospital, I'm sending data to Humana and Humana has their own credentialing requirements for the state or, or even the county that I live in. Right. I know before I send that data to Humana that it meets their compliance guidelines. And when Humana receives it, they know immediately that it meets it meets their uh, guidelines as well. And this whole exercise of re-verifying the same set of information goes away. Right. And, you know, I, my colleagues and I, I you know, we believe that, that the healthcare industry probably spends over a hundred billion dollars a year and, and, and wasted time um, just doing all this verification stuff. Right. And, and the, and also just the forfeitures and revenue that organizations experience um, waiting for this process to play out. Right. And, you know, this technology and directly enabled our ability to build this solution in a way uh, that uh, that helps everybody. It's a it's a think of it almost as a community benefit, because at the end of the day, if your emergency room doesn't have enough doctors or, you know, your uh, you know, your uh, hospitals low on hospitalists, everybody loses. Right. It's a net loser for everyone in the community and not just you know one organization. And, you know, as I said earlier, our focus is ensuring that those those professionals that serve our community can do so efficiently. Well, I know that you, you know, explained, you know, also how long it takes sometimes in in the in the past to check on the credentials. And like you said, the variety of, of types of credentials, sometimes, you know, people will do calling, but there's different expectations, you know, of how the credentials are verified. That's well, that's different rules, right? You know, and let me give you a great example. Um, an organization may say, uh, I, if I have a peer reference for a practitioner, it cannot be older than six months old. Whereas an organization down the street may say, I'll take it up to a year. And another person may say, it's got to be 30 days or less, right? So it's that, it's the application of those specific requirements that allow the, you know, the platform to do what it does. You want to show, I know that you have some slides, some visuals, which I always love. Would you like to um, show the visuals? Sure, just a couple here. Just a couple. I don't want to put, put the whole audience to sleep. <laughs> no, no, no. I think for, the, for a lot of these companies that are listening, they are going to be very, and also I want to make sure everyone knows that, um, you know, Anthony's um, websites and links contact will be embedded below so that way you can reach out ask him questions and see if the services that they're providing at ProCredX can benefit your company and what you're doing so i see for those that are on the audio side i see a slide and it has uh, five different bullet points and it's called the basics so why don't you go ahead and describe what is the basics all about so these are the, the, the highest level functions that we perform on the platform for our membership, if you will. So we, we first can organize the credentials electronically, right? And as I mentioned, that includes people, equipment, and organizations, right? All three of those classes of participants have to be credentialed, right? We then take those rules that I mentioned earlier and we check for gaps in compliance. 
through the lenses of the organizations that are looking at that data is really important. And frankly, technically, it was extremely challenging for us to, to build this, right? Um, we then obtain the credentials um, needed across a constituency of, of organizations, right? So, you know, health insurers may have some things they need. Hospitals have things they need. Outpatient specialty clinics have things they need. And we get that in one place, if you will, right? We then allow... Um, we allow organizations to bundle that data together and deliver it to their business partners in a way, as I mentioned earlier, where they know that that information is compliant with their requirements. And finally, we have a, you know, we work directly with industry accreditors and government regulators to create a top to bottom electronic auditing and reporting uh, 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 process across all of our networks, right? So if you're CMS, for example, and you want to, uh, you know, you want to analyze credentials for a payer uh, who's doing Medicare Advantage, um, you know, rather than sending somebody out on a plane, walking into an office, pulling 20 paper files, going through them and analyzing, you know, and auditing them, you can do it in real time and know at every, mi every minute whether someone is or is or is not going to fall out of compliance, right? Um, we also, that function works in the opposite way as well, where organizations can quickly say, do I have anybody that's going to fall out of compliance today or tomorrow or next week, right? And, and proactively um, maintain that compliance rather than waiting for a biennial or triennial recredentialing process to check for gaps, right? And that, because, that's, uh, real, that's really important because also just from the cost perspective, if someone misses their, you know, the timeline that they need, then they have to, sometimes they have to go through a longer process of, instead of just the, a fast renewal. So, you know, on That's many levels, correct. this is really important. That's correct. And again, you know, I know we've talked a lot about healthcare today, but this is applicable to any regulated industry, right? And, you know, one of our fastest growing markets right now is the non-emergency medical transport industry, right? Where, you know, these are the folks that um, take the infirmed in vans, um, you know, or, or gurneys or whatnot and move, you know, take them from an assisted living community to a doctor's uh, office visit to the grocery store and then back home, right? Um, you know, we work directly with the industry accreditor who is called NEMTAC to develop an, an industry-wide platform for managing credentials for all members of that supply chain. So transportation providers, transportation brokers, managed care organizations, state Medicaid agencies, and so forth, right? They all can collaborate on compliance collectively and, and end the guessing game as to who's in compliance and who's not. And the risks that are associated with being non-compliant. Vis-a-vis, let's say something bad happens, God forbid, you know, a, a person gets in a car accident in a, in, a, in, a, in a transportation event and the patient gets harmed, right? Well, if it's determined after the fact that that person was not adequately licensed or their insurance wasn't adequately uh, engaged, it's a giant problem for everybody, right? It's not a problem for the driver or the patient, right? It becomes a massive liability and huge quality problem and it can be completely avoided by, by proactively understanding compliance data and managing it effectively. Why don't you show the next slide? Because I, I, yeah. like, I like the visuals that you have. Yeah, so you know, I talk what, is, what is this? Uh, explain a little bit, oh, for those, oh, sorry, for those that are on the audio side, uh, the slide that we're looking at is titled Validation Engine, and it's showing yeah. a variety of ways that um, uh, you help and serve. So go ahead and explain a little bit more. Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we ingest the data in, in whatever form it exists in, from a cred typically from a credentialing system that's being used at a hospital or a health plan or whatnot, and we make sense of it. We organize it, if you will, um, and, and we've got our own proprietary data engine that uses both structured and unstructured data storage techniques to manage that data. Once we've made sense of it, we can then take the rules that organizations define about what's what that data needs to what, what compliance looks like, I should say, for an individual uh, facility or for uh, an occupation or whatnot. And we then can analyze that data in toto and make sense of it and, and make those compliance determinations, right? It was, it's a very, very sophisticated 
rules engine and uh, that uses some machine learning capabilities to make those an analytics uh, 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 complete, right? The um, next thing is, you know, we talked about earlier is our, how we use distributed ledger, right? We, as when we consume this data through our consumption engine, you know, we immediately take everything about that data, hash it and store it onto the ledger, right? And this creates permanent immutability and traceability and auditability for the data, right? So we can say 10 years from now, you know, we have a credential for Dr. Smith and 345 organizations have, have, uh, have used that or have, you know, verified it or whatnot. And it gives the data richness. It gives the data security and reliability. Right. Um, and what, again, you know, what we form are not, you know, individual customers, but we form collaborative networks that bring together industry constituents in ways that have never been done before and allow this collaboration to exist across the exchange. Right. So I like this visual for those that are on the audio side, it shows the collaborative networks from uh, the the payers to the health systems to the physician organizations to primary sources and the consumer parties because we also we often don't think about the whole economy of who needs this information and who could possibly that's correct this information that's that is correct you know and and i'll also say i do want to show one other thing that i'm quite yep. proud of um our results are almost stunning um we have uh we have documented um that we can show about a 75% reduction in redundant credentialing work, right? 95% uh, reduction in credentials handling time, right? And we can complete entire um, organizational compliance audits in under a minute, right? You know, it, and these are things that people would spend months doing, right? And it can be done in minutes or hours, right? So it's a, it's a significant value proposition, uh, again, to the industry not to an individual organization. Yeah, and right. as we talked about also when we were talking offline, um, you know, this provides both um, time efficiency so the organization can use their staff in different ways that uh, it's not eliminating people, it's just making um, the resources that each organization has more efficient. Because That's exactly correct. Yeah, technology can be, you know, used smartly and, you um, you know, it's, you know, why work harder when you can work smart? And if you can use the technology to help you with that, then you can actually do the analysis, something more higher level. And I'm not even going to get into artificial intelligence, you know, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's the type of thing that really will, um, I think, with staffing shortages, I think it will make it uh, um, the use of the staff less painful for staff because sometimes we have so many projects on our shoulders and um, that all need to get done. So this is a way that you can delegate in a way that you can actually be much more efficient and productive. You know, the folks at, in healthcare, uh, especially the folks that do credentialing work very hard. Yeah. It is a very difficult and challenging job. And our, our goal is to not eliminate jobs. No, our no. goal is to, is to re relieve uh, these people who do this all day, every day of a lot of the administrative burden and redundant, unnecessary work that they do and let them focus on the real effort, which is you know, analyzing quality, analyzing fit and making sure that the right people are there treating their patients, yeah. right? And getting folks who need to get to get to work, getting them to work more quickly, right? Why don't as simple you as that. Um, go ahead and share how people would reach out to you even though the information will be embedded, you know, in the blog below, but why don't you go ahead and share with everyone? Sure. The, the, the easiest way to get a hold of us is through our website, which is www.procredx.com, which will be uh, listed below. There's a contact us page there that will, will um, send information directly to us. And, and we would love to have a conversation if, uh, if folks are interested in how we can potentially help their organizations and their networks function more efficiently. Um, are you looking for people if they're looking at, um, you know, the job market? Yeah, we, we are, we're growing like wildfire right now. And um, we are looking for some engineering resources uh, right now, as well as um, uh, we call onboarding support uh, folks who can help us um, bring on our new customers and help them digitize their data and, and, and whatnot. 
Um, so if, if there are folks in the industry that are looking for those kinds of roles in a rapidly growing startup you know, environment, we'd love to talk to people. Can the jobs be remote or do they have to be in a certain location? Uh, we are 100% remote, the entire company. Exactly right. I know. Yep. I know. kind of figured that, but I'd throw it out there because, again, that's a question people ask. So um, any last minute thoughts before we wrap up our conversation? I know we're going to have more than one episode because there's different conversations that we're going to have. So everyone, you should definitely, um, you know, like and subscribe so you can stay tuned for other conversation with Anthony. But are there, is there any last minute thoughts that you'd like to share? I just like to put a, reach a hand out to my, my team who has done an amazing job building this business from literally an idea on a whiteboard to this tremendous, uh, you know, machine that we have, have, uh, have deployed in the marketplace. So thank you all very much. You've done a great job. And you know what I love about what you just said, the idea that you can actually take an idea and really think through all the pieces and make it grow and succeed. I mean, that's the entrepreneurial spirit. And yep. um, it's very always exciting when, you know, you hear about these stories of success. So um, definitely congrats on that. And for everyone who's listening, definitely, you know, reach out to Anthony through the website that will be embedded below. And also definitely, you know, look into uh, becoming a member of GBA at gbaglobal.org. They are an excellent organization, especially if you're learning about blockchain and you want to network more to kind of, to build up your own uh, background knowledge. And for sure, if you have any questions, reach out to me as well at CryptoMom2.com. So thank you, Anthony, for being on. And I look forward to meeting you in real life, uh, not just on our Zoom. And uh, thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Talk to you soon.